admitting everyone. Oh my god. Hello and welcome everyone. Hey Kara. Hey Julie. We invite you to turn on your camera and say hello. Yeah, this is a unique format for us, a much more personable opportunity to uh, actually be able to unmute yourself too and be able to uh, vocalize in some of these, in, in this specific presentation where otherwise we don't usually have that feature. But if not, you could go ahead uh, and in the chat, let us know your first name and your city and something that's inspired you recently. And Lisa and Danielle, we invite you to do the same. <laughs> we have just a few minutes for a few more people to show up and then we'll go ahead and just get started. Springtime in Sonoma County is always a good one, Lisa. It's hard not to feel inspired when you see all the flowering plants everywhere. Absolutely. We just took a hike at Crane Canyon. It's beautiful and it's just so inspiring. Julie in Santa Rosa, inspired by vaccines, also a great reason to feel inspired lately. <laughs> There's hope. <laughs> There's a light at the end of the tunnel. Ooh, Danielle's feeling inspired by the tide pools. I love the tide pools. I feel inspired that I'm starting to see starfish in the tide pools again. There was a couple of years where we weren't seeing uh, starfish anymore. Yeah, I went to Duxbury Reef for the first time and just absolutely loved it. It was so beautiful. Give it one more minute and then I'll just go ahead and dive in. Really inspired by my ducks that are totally alerting me to a cat nearby trying to get them. I don't know if anybody can hear them in the background, but they are there quacking away. Hi, Heather, welcome. Vaccinated, <laughs> past tense, awesome, congratulations. Congratulations. Thank you. It was through my school that I work at, it's great. Okay, well, now that we're a few minutes in, I'm just going to go ahead and get started. So, Liz, you want to start the presentation? Yeah, you got it. Okay. Just the next slide. Next slide. Oh, leave it to the technology to kind of glitch out right when we're here. You got this, Liz. <laughs> PowerPoint, you got this. You heard those words of encouragement. Change it on the back end, not on the front, of course. Oh, all there right. There we go. 
Perfect. <laughs> Thank you everyone so much for being here today and welcome to our meeting from Household to Headwaters, How Our Choices at Home Impact Our Watershed. My name is Serena and I'm a programs coordinator at Daily Act. I am accompanied today by Danielle from the city of Petaluma and Lisa from Recology, who I'll introduce further later before they present, as well as my colleague Liz, who's the senior programs coordinator at Daily Acts and will be helping me behind the scenes. Today, we're gonna to talk about the recent dredging of the Petaluma River, some of the interesting findings and how it all relates back to the actions we take at home every day in our watershed health. Before we dive in, I'm gonna give you a little bit of background about Daily Acts, so let's go ahead and get started. So Daily Acts is a holistic education nonprofit that takes a heart-centered approach to inspiring transformative action that creates a connected, equitable, and climate resilient community. We believe in the power of our daily actions to reconnect people to self, community, and place, which helps heal our society and planet. We believe that the crisis of connection is at the core of our environmental and social issues. People are disconnected from their power, from nature, from community, and from this big planetary moment of crisis and opportunity. Our holistic approach to addressing this crisis starts in the soil and swells in the culture and policy change. We have sustainability programs that provide the skills, tools, and resources to conserve natural resources while growing food, medicine, habitat, and community. Because change happens through collaboration, we invest in strengthening community leadership. Our Leadership Institute for Just and Resilient Communities is a 10 month long program that trains leaders to step up to the many challenges that our community faces today, while embracing the complexity of the interconnected systems at play. We are also home to the Environmental Health Network that provides education and resources to our frontline agricultural workers and their communities here in Sonoma County. Just last year, we adopted the amazing Eco to School program that inspires youth to take immediate climate action and gives them the means to do so. We foster networks and alliances, as you can see today, with all the amazing organizations, businesses, and government programs here in Sonoma County and beyond. And we're always trying to ignite and inspire change in our community through our action campaigns that we host almost every single year. And we do all of this through practicing personal ecology because we believe that transforming the world really begins with transforming yourself. So we made this a meeting today instead of a webinar because we're really excited to see your faces and we miss seeing you guys at our in-person program. But please keep your microphone on mute during the presentation when you're not speaking. If a question arises during the presentation, please use the chat box. Um, if something seems relevant to answer immediately, Liz will let me know and she'll, uh, she'll interrupt me and say, hey, Serena, uh, Heather has a great question and we'll go ahead and address it. But if else, uh, all other questions can be answered at the end of our presentation, as we'll have some time to all chat with each other. So our agenda for today will first be covering the dredging of the Petaluma River and some interesting findings. Then we're gonna talk about watersheds and stormwater and how pollution travels. Then we'll talk about household actions to minimize stormwater pollution. Then Lisa from Recology is gonna to talk to us a little bit about managing household waste. And then Danielle from the city of Petaluma is gonna tell us about city practices to prevent stormwater pollution. And then at the end of this, we'll have time for questions and even just a little bit of conversation if that's what we're feeling. So at Daily Acts, we always like to start our presentations and our work days with a quote. And my favorite quote is never doubt that a small group of thoughtful committed citizens can change the world. Indeed, it's the only thing that ever has, and it's by Margaret Mead. And the fact that you're all here today to learn about keeping our watershed healthy really means that we're already changing the world one household at a time. So dredging, just to make sure we're all on the page, same page, what is dredging? According to the National Ocean Service, dredging is the removal of sediments and debris from the bottom of lakes, rivers, harbors, and other water bodies. It is routine necessity in waterways around the world because of sedimentation, the natural process of sand and silt washing downstream, gradually filling channels and harbors. Dredging is often focused on maintaining or increasing the depth of navigation channels to ensure the safe passage of boats and ships. 
vessels require a certain amount of water in order to float and not touch the bottom. Dredging is also performed to reduce the exposure of fish, wildlife, and people to contaminants and to prevent the spread of contaminants to other areas of the water body. This environmental dredging is often necessary because sediments in and around cities and industrial areas are frequently contaminated with a variety of pollutants. If you're a Petaluma resident like I am, you know that the dredging of the Petaluma River was a much anticipated event that occurred over a six week period at the end of 2020. At one time, our Petaluma River was actually dredged every four years, but this time it had been 17 years since our last dredging. Many key community members, businesses, and organizations rallied together to make this happen with support from the Petaluma residents, as was shown with Mayor Teresa Barrett's garnering of over 2,500 signatures on the Mayor's Dredge Pledge, which I myself signed at the 2019 River Revival. Results of the dredging were interesting, however. The dredging of the Petaluma River ended up siphoning way more trash than was expected, including more notable items such as tires, shopping carts, half a dozen bowling balls, an entire car, and even part of a gun, which definitely raised a few eyeballs according to the Argus Courier. The Argus Courier also noted that right before the end of the dredging, around 194,000 cubic yards of silt and trash were dredged up from the river, which was enough to fill more than 1,300 dump trucks. So at some point today, actually, we're supposed to have um, John Shrivs as a part of our audience, and he was going to tell us a little bit about the work that the volunteers have been doing. Oh, and it looks like he's here just coming in right now. So I'm actually going to give him a second to come in um, and connect. John, uh, we are just to the part where I was going to introduce you so you have impeccable timing. He might still be connecting to the audio. <laughs> give him just a minute. John? Hello, I'm here. Hi, John. Um, I was just getting to the part where we were talking about the dredging of the Petaluma River and some of the resulting yeah. trash that was found. I know you just got on the call. Thank you so much for being here today. Uh, would you mind taking a few minutes to tell us a little bit about the work that you did and maybe some of the things you found? Um, no, I'm, I'm actually not, I wasn't involved in that um, project. So. John Shrids is now in my waiting room. I'm so sorry. <laughs> <laughs> we have two Johns in our audience today. All right. The other John. Another John. Yes. So I, I w I'm just interested in the, in the findings myself. So I'm not, I can't uh, contribute very much. I'm here more of the listening than um, um, giving you feedback. That's so great. I just love that you both happen to come in at the same time. Okay, John Shrimps is in the audience, correct? Correct, I'm here now. Hi, John, how are you doing today? All right. I Thank you so much my, for being uh, here. Wetlands Alliance uh, board meeting and uh, talking about what we're going to do next and the next cleanup. Well, we would love to hear about that too. I just finished telling everybody uh, about the dredging of the Petaluma River and we'd love to hear what your group has been up to and maybe some of the things that you guys found. Uh, right now? Yeah, right now, if you don't mind. Well, well, well you're looking at it. That, that's my photograph, I think. <laughs> Absolutely. Um, so th this is just one day of what we found, uh, a group of about 12 people. That's what maximum allowed out at any one day. So uh, between 10 and 12 of us were out almost every day for two weeks solid. And this is one day's work um, that we pulled out using uh, just picking stuff up, putting over five gallon pan, uh, pails and uh, with my pickup truck, just dumping it in the back there and, and hauling it out and putting it in, in this dumpster. And that shows you the variety of stuff. All the, most of it plastic of one sort or another. There's some rubber things in there. There's a few metal things in there that stuck in the mud but the majority of it was a plastic based. Um, and plastic, as you may be aware, floats in water. And so anytime plastic is dumped on the ground, um, instead of entering into the ground, it has a, a rain will come and will float it down into the creeks, which will float it down into the river. Um, and then eventually with all the sedge, um, the, the sediments that are moving back and forth and finally get stuck somewhere, 
uh, and then gets stuck in the mud and then gets buried uh, eventually. And then when the dredgers come in, they lift it up out of the mud and then they, it gets sucked through the pipe. Uh, things like bowling balls got stuck in the pipe and that was the hardest thing for them to get out of the pipes. Uh, but there were several bowling balls they had to actually drill out of the pipe um, to make it work because they got stuck so hard. And I was out there and I watched them pull off tires, cables, chains, which they hauled out directly uh, from there, from the dredger. But this is all the stuff that came through the pipe. Uh, this is on top of all the furniture, the desks and stuff that they found in the basin. Um, and a lot of uh, golf balls, um, a lot of various other balls that floated down into the water and then floated down in. Um, a lot of round stuff that, that rolls, uh, a lot of the baskets uh, that you can see, lots of stuff. Um, only a couple needles um, and syringes were found. For the most part, it was just human dumpings. All right, that gives you an idea of uh, what, um, what we have just, that's uh, just a one day's work. And then we did this for 14 days straight. Wow, so that's, that's a lot of trash that was found in that dredge material. Uh, yes, I says I filled up my pickup truck over 10 times, uh, completely full. That's so crazy. And including even a car door we found. Wow. And then we went along the river and, and picked up, we also picked up a lot of wood that drifts in because there's a lot of stuff that comes off all the docks that are falling apart, the styrofoam that falls apart as well as the docking and that floats down and is our hazards for boats. So all the wood, um, and so we have a, a Schollenberger has a place where it tends to end up in one location because it's just the right spot for wood to kind of, kind of drift into and get caught in, in the vegetation. So, uh, but there's lots of sp spots like that up and down our river. And this is just one spot. That's incredible. Thank you so much for sharing that with us, John. Yeah, a huge community effort, by the way. It was a multi-organization. Daily X was part of that. Friends of the Pennell River, Point Blue came in. Um, so everybody and even local companies sent a whole team of folks in for a couple of days. Um, so yeah, it was a huge community effort to, to make this, this work. And uh, I can now walk, we, we cleaned out what we could, what we could walk because you sink in up to knee level and then it's hard to get out. So uh, I just walked it this morning and said, oh, we can actually get out to the next layer out there. So maybe in, in a week or two, if folks are ready, we may have another cleanup party coming up here soon. Yeah, and John, let us know when that's happening and we'll help spread the word about that too, because yeah, we'd love to be a part of that. Well, thank you so much for sharing about that. Um, and actually, just out of curiosity too, John, do you know, um, somebody, Courtney asked um, exactly what was done with the, the silt dredge material after the trash was removed. Do you know exactly where it went? Oh, it, uh, it goes, there's 200,000 uh, cubic yards of material, which is like 40% more than expected. That was went and moved in, it's all been, uh, at least from the upper river, got put into Schollenberger Park. The lower river, which was also, they spent a couple of days dredging down near the, um, uh, where San Pablo Bay enters in um, that area. And that was done by a different style of dredger and piled onto other uh, barges and shipped somewhere. So that dredging went somewhere, but this is 200,000 yards came into Schollenberger Park, which is actually a dredge spoils industrial waste site. That's its main purpose, not a park. A park was sort of like a uh, layer on top of the waste disposal site. So, um, this dredge spoils, all that material eventually will need to be trucked out and used as landfill uh, where it can be used. So we can actually be sold for uh, use as long as there's enough trash picked out of it. If there's too much trash in it, it cannot be used. That's why it's so critical that we work as a community and save the city lots of money because um, at 50 plus dollars an hour for the city to pay for someone to go out there and clean it up, the city cannot afford to do that but having volunteers do it um, makes it much reasonable and getting the trash out will allow the city then to come back and, and sell that so that someone will want to actually come in and, and remove the material for us and get us ready for the next dredging that we need to do. Yeah, absolutely. And you know, that's why we're all here today too, is we wanna investigate some of the ways that we could try to keep this trash out of the waterway to begin with so we don't have to do this again during the next dredging event, hopefully, yeah, at least to this extent. And I did get two little produ um, videos produced uh, to talk a little bit the dredging and the cleanup and the trash. 
Uh, so I was able to interview the mayor. I've got that. And then also interviewed an engineer, the John Sanguilet, who I've talked about the dredging process. Uh, and I collected a lot of um, uh, video, for drone video also got included. So uh, those are almost completely done. And I'm still doing some final touches. When they're done, uh, they will be posted on our website at Petaluma Wetlands Alliance, and maybe even the city website also. Well, great. Yeah, we'll be excited to help spread the word about those videos too. I'm sure there's a lot of really uh, awesome information in there. So thank you, John. Thank you so much for sharing with us today. Good, okay. continue on. I'm, I'm sorry, I, I, I just jumped in and interrupted you guys. So. Oh, no, no, you came in perfect timing. I was just about, I was like, oh, well, I hope, I hope John's here soon. And you jumped in in perfect timing. I actually thought the other John here was you <laughs> too. So seriously, perfect timing. Thank you so much for sharing your experience about it. Okay, so I'm gonna jump back into our presentation today. Um, Speaking of all the trash that we found after the recent dredging of the Petaluma River, one of the reasons why we're all here today is because, did you know, that the most common litter found in the United States streams is household trash. This includes plastic cups, plastic bags, wrapping materials, fast food wrappers, plastic bottles, other plastic containers, everything John just mentioned, you name it. It might not happen at the household necessarily, it could be at a picnic, it could be at a soccer game, it could be at some sort of sport event or another type of outdoor gathering. And I know that cigarettes held the title for the most common litter item for many years. As you can see, this data was taken in 2018, but other items are catching up quickly. And I'm guessing that plastic items are probably at the top of this list now. According to the American Rivers Organization, in 2018, the five most common items found in river cleanups included cigarettes, plastic bottles, bottle caps, food packaging, plastic bags, and aluminum can. What can we do to prevent these items from washing into our waterways to begin with? Well, first, I think it's gonna help to understand how water moves through our urban environment. But before we dive into that, I have a few poll questions to gauge what your current understanding of urban water movement is. Liz, you wanna go ahead and launch that poll? Consider it launched. Hopefully folks are seeing this poll on their screen. Someone let us know if they're seeing the poll. Are folks seeing the poll? Oops. Yes. Okay. Received it. Received it. Uh, but it's long. It's got a couple of questions on it and it takes a little bit of time to read. So Perfect. I wanted here. to make sure you could see it. It, it scrolls you. down, everyone. So keep scrolling down and, and answering. So for anybody who might be watching on our Facebook Live, I'm just going to read the poll questions out really quick so people know what we're looking at here. So the first question is, which of the statements best describes what you believe a watershed to be? If it's an area that retains water, like a swamp or a marsh, a land area that drains into a specific body of water, or a water intake area that feeds a water treatment plant. Our second question is, as far as you know, do you live in a watershed? Our third question is, does the city of Petaluma's sanitary sewer and stormwater system flow through the same system of pipes? Our fourth question is, where does stormwater runoff go once it enters a storm drain? And the fifth question is, does your roof water or gutter system flow on the pavement or grass? And we'll give everyone just a few minutes to fill those out. Looks like we've got 100% of people voting. So I will go ahead and end the poll and I'll share these results. Nice. Everybody lives in a watershed. Yeah, Liz, can you read the results? Oh, I can't certainly. Them. <laughs> certainly, no problem. So for number one, which of these statements best describes what you believe to be a watershed? We have most people saying a land area that drains into a specific body of water. Awesome. Uh, and then everybody agrees that they live in a watershed. 
And then number three, we had a variety of different responses here from yes, no, and I'm not sure. The question being, does the city of Petaluma's sanitary sewer and stormwater system flow through the same system of pipes? We have an answer there, or will Danielle get into that one? Alrighty, and then number four, we have where does stormwater runoff go once it enters the storm drain? Fantastic, everybody here is well aware that it goes right into that closest river or stream. And then the final question, does your roof water slash gutter system flow onto pavement, grass, or permeable surface? Uh, again, another mixture of responses from paved surfaces, lawn, permeable surfaces, and not sure. Perfect. Thank you, everyone, for giving us that baseline of what you know about this. So that wraps up our poll questions, and thanks for your honest answers. Um, so before Lisa and Danielle present, I'm just going to go over a few of the things that we polled you guys about to make sure we're all on the same page about these basic terms and definitions and the way that water flows through our urban environment before we talked about some of those solutions. So we're going to start with the basics of what is a watershed. A watershed is an area of land where all the water drains into a single water body, such as a river, lake, or ocean. Watersheds are divided from each other by elevated land features such as hills and mountain ridges. Watersheds are often named after the river or creek that they drain into. For instance, our Petaluma River watershed is named after the Petaluma River. A little bit of a, a lag with the presentation. Trust me. It'll show up. We're just keeping it interesting. It's okay, Liz. We're keeping it very interesting. It, it pivots on one end and then not on your end, which is interesting to me. I think it will catch up if, if you continue. <laughs> okay. So the Petaluma watershed is a diverse is diverse and includes the city of Petaluma as well as vital rural and agricultural lands. Mountainous or hilly upland comprises about 56% of our watershed and 33% of our watershed is valley and the lowest 11% is salt marshes. Sonoma Mountain at 2,295 feet is the highest point in our watershed and the Petaluma River empties into the northwest portion of San Pablo Bay as uh, Dr. John Shrivs talked about earlier. Liz, I am going to wait for the next slide for this next one. Yeah, no worries. Yeah, there we oh, go. there we go. Perfect. Okay. So now that we all are on the same page about what a watershed is, what if I told you that you could think of your house as its own watershed? The highest peak is your roof, and the water moves down from the sides of your roof into the rain gutters, where it's led either to pavement, grass, or permeable surface, as we just talked about in our poll questions. Depending on what surface the water is led to, it's gonna do one of a couple of things. It's gonna sink into the ground, replenishing your soil and the water table below, or it might slide over the surface and down the street and into the storm drain. In the photo below, you can see water sliding over the surface and into the storm drain below. You might have previously thought of grass as a permeable surface, but water actually tends to sheet over grass when it rains, especially in a big rain event. This is why we included grass separately in our survey question earlier. In this next photo, you can see that water moves from the roof here into a rainwater tank on the left side of the image. Water is collected in a rainwater tank can be used to irrigate your garden after a rain event occurs, meaning that it can slowly reabsorb into the soil instead of running away into the storm drain. You'll also notice in this photo a nice little rain garden that the rain gutter leads to on the other side of the roof. Rain gardens allow rainwater to be slowed down, sunk, and stored in the ground in your soil. If you're interested in learning more about landscape practices from flowing straight into the storm drains, make sure to attend our webinar next week, Respecting Our Rivers, Landscape Pollution Prevention Practices. So let's talk about the sewer versus the storm drain. This was also one of our poll questions. Um, this is where everything's gonna come together. When there is a storm, the water that washes over our landscapes and into the storm drains is picking up whatever's on our roof, whatever's in our driveway, whatever on the landscape, and carries it into the storm drains. Here in Petaluma, our storm drain system is separate from our sanitary system. This means the water that runs through our storm drains goes straight into our streams, rivers, and waterways, completely untreated. So, like you guys all got that in the poll question, just goes straight 
from storm drain to river to stream to whatever body of water is closest by. So what is storm water? Storm water is exactly what it sounds like. It's water from a storm, including rain, hail, and snow. Think of the city of Petaluma and imagine what the different surfaces of our city look like. And then if you imagine individual raindrops falling during a storm, where are the raindrops landing? Are they landing on an asphalt parking lot? Are they landing on some grass in a business parking? Like, you know, the business park's covered in just like, you know, grass. Are they landing there? Are they landing on a mulched landscape? Are they landing on bare soil? Like we just finished discussing, discussing <laughs> where the stormwater lands is really going to indicate where the water is going to go. Stormwater can soak into the ground or it can go into a waterway. In our increasingly urban environments with impermeable surfaces, it can land on a roof, in a parking lot, on a street, and then trickle or even flood into the storm drain system. So the purpose of the storm drain system is to carry rainfall and runoff from city streets to local waterways. You'll see this action on a after a rainy day or a rainy night. Rain that doesn't seep into the earth flows into the gutters, through under pipes and open, and open ditches, and discharges untreated into local streams, rivers, and other surface water bodies. Storm drain inlets are typically found in curbs in low-lying outdoor areas. The storm drain, as we said, is not the sewer. So anything that goes into the storm drain, again, is just going untreated directly into our local waterways. This means that pollutants can be picked up by runoff and watershed and washed into our creeks and eventually into the San Francisco Bay. And that's not only harmful to the critters that depend on our waterways, but it also has the potential to impact public health and diminish local recreational opportunities. So now that we're all familiar with how water moves through our storm drain system, what sort of things in the, is the water picking up along the way on its journey through our storm drain system? Unfortunately, physical trash isn't the only pollutant to wash into our waterways via storm water. Other potential pollutants that can get picked up by storm water include fertilizers and pesticides, excess sediment from loose soil, soaps and detergents used to wash things outside of our homes, animal waste, and oils and greases that have leaked. As individuals, we actually have a lot of control when it comes to keeping our watershed healthy. Our everyday actions at home really have a direct impact on the health of our beloved Petaluma River. So then what kind of choices can we make to protect our waterways and prevent stormwater pollution? According to the University of California IPM Statewide Integrated Pest Management Program, Integrated pest management, one example, sometimes called IPM, is a process used to solve pest management problems without pesticides, minimizing risk to people and the environment. While you might have heard of it used in an agricultural context, it can also be used in an urban setting. It is an ecosystem based strategy that uses techniques such as habitat manipulation and use of resistant varieties of plants. I remember being a kid when my dad would be gardening and he would get like a package of ladybugs every year to deal with the aphids on his roses. And I just always loved seeing all the ladybugs crawling around after they were released. And that's one good example of IPM. If you think about it, urban soils make up a significant portion of soils here in Petaluma, since we do have a lot of urban landscaping between our houses and between business buildings. Taking good care of the soil in your yard has many benefits, including better water retention, increased soil absor increased carbon absorption, and less erosion washing into our stormwater. As consumers, our choices matter. If you're going to be using soaps and detergents in your front or backyard, make sure to go for the eco-friendly choices. Now that you know that the water washes away from these, doesn't get treated. Make sure to properly dispose of your pet's waste and to also dispose of any toxic waste product properly. One really awesome resource that Danielle is gonna to touch on as well is Oh Wow, Our Water, Our World, which has an amazing website that'll list out some products for you um, based on all the things that I just discussed if you want specific product names. I uh, will send you that website in our follow-up email after this meeting. So speaking of properly disposing our waste, I am certainly not an expert on that, but we did bring in somebody to talk about it. I'm really excited to introduce our next presenter, Lisa Moore. Lisa is the Recology Sonoma Marin Waste Bureau Specialist for the city of Petaluma. She educates schools, businesses, and community groups on how to recycle and compost properly. 
She is also focused on the greening of festivals and events by working closely with community groups and festival organizers. With that being said, Liz, do you want to go ahead and stop your screen share and let Lisa start her presentation? Got it. Thanks for joining us today, Lisa. Thank you. Let me look at my, my screen share here. Perfect. So hi, I'm Lisa Moore. I'm a waste earth specialist and I my territory is Petaluma. So um, we'll just get right into it is this is going to be basically a presentation on compost recycling and garbage and what goes where and a little bit of information about our company, a little information about Petaluma, what um, the materials that you recycle, where do they go? So um, my first slide is reduce, reuse, recycle, rot, and recologize. Let me see if I can get this. Okay. So we started in Sonoma County around December 23rd, 2017, where an ESOP were employee owned. Um, and so we have about 460 employees and we are a union shop. So we have a part of our team is a Teamsters under Union 665. So we also do really wonderful volunteer events. And so um, this one's at Howarth Park in Santa Rosa, but we've done one in Petaluma. We fixed up Wickersham Park um, in collaboration with Daily Acts. Uh, and so that was just a wonderful event and uh, a lot of picking up of trash, a lot of picking up of litter at that time. So um, that's all part of our, our volunteers. It's about 150 to 200 people of our company volunteer for these. We do maybe five or six a year. Oh, we used to. We will continue that after the pandemic. So our service area is uh, Sonoma and Marin County, um, um, West Marin and Nevada. And so we have roughly around 155,000 customers and uh, residential and commercial. So this is kind of what I do. And so this is, if you look at this slide, um, the before is a big, huge garbage, a very small compost and a small recycle. So what I do is I go in and audit a business or, or a school and make adjustment, adjustments to where you see the after is a bigger recycle, bigger compost and a smaller garbage. So a lot of these resources are going straight to the landfill. So my job is to, to look at that stream and see what we can recover as resources because what recology looks at is this isn't garbage, these are resources. And um, so compost and recycling definitely. And then the, again, the smaller garbage. We do green teams. You can see this is our one of our awesome green teams. And so we go to schools. We, um, you know, it'll come back in the next couple of years, but we love to get businesses having green teams. We go in and we train everybody. Um, we sing with compost and recycling, and it's great. It's great to have all that wonderful enthusiasm um, for people to want to recycle and, and compost properly. So some of the things that I help with the state of California is we have laws that are mandatory, mandatory composting, mandatory recycling, um, AB 1826, AB 341. And then we're, we have a new law that's being implemented and it'll be effective in 2022, where all accounts um, that are commercial have to have um, compost programs. So what's exciting for me in Petaluma right now is commercial compost has just become a free program where in the past you had to pay for it. So I'm setting up lots and lots of compost programs right now in Petaluma. It's just a wonderful kind of enthusiasm you get. And um, so you'll see me all over. You'll see now compost bins all over in um, shopping centers and restaurants. So that's just a really great thing. So. This is what we do is we go in and we help restaurants or, or shopping um, centers know about the laws, what they're required to do, and then we help them get to that final um, outcome. So composting. So I'm gonna talk a little bit about composting. So in our stream, you can compost anything, meat, cheese, bones, all of that can go into compost. 
pizza boxes, um, tea bags, coffee filters, um, yard waste, it all goes into your green bin or your green cart. Um, napkins, paper towels, any kind of tissues, because our compost runs about 140 degrees. So all those pathogens are burned off. So everybody wants to know where their compost goes. You know, once I put it in there, where does it go? So we have about four different facilities that take all of our compost. One's in Ukiah, Cold, Cold Creek. Um, I have to get my notes on this one because it's always, I always mess up. Um, and that's in Ukiah, Napa Recycling in Napa. Republic does our commercial compost and they're out of Richmond. And then um, Waste Management has compost where most of Petaluma's um, residential goes down in Novato. So really the composting is all domestic. So what you put into your compost it's, gets mixed and that'll be my next couple of slides. You'll see what it turns into. So this is some of the contamination that we pull out of our compost. So when I see any of those little stickers and this has to go with wastewater too. The wastewater treatment plant, this is like their, their bane of existence is to get these little stickers because they go on all the little holes. So that's actually garbage. If you can peel those off and put them in the garbage, any kind of compostable plastic needs to go into the garbage. We don't have a facility that will take compostable plastic at this time. So at some point we might, but we don't have a facility that will take it right now. Um, all the things on the side, um, plastic bottles, if you keep the cap on, those are more, um, the caps are more likely to be recycled. So that's a recyclable thing. Styrofoam is garbage. Um, move my, can't really see all in there, but all those materials are either recyclable or, or garbage or um, non-compostable. So you see this, this is, um, it, it, this always cracks me up because we have a farmer that has tomatoes and then there's a banana peel, but stay with me. So all of your fruits and vegetables, everything that you don't eat or you're not using for any kind of stock or anything can go into your green cart. And then um, we take it to a facility where it's turned into windrows. And then um, eventually when 90, about 60 to 90 days, it turns into compost. And this is just another slide of how that goes. So once it's turned and, and you know, there's um, that whole process, and then it's watered at the same time. And at the final thing, we call it black gold because we sell it to farmers and we sell it to vintners. And at some point during, especially during springtime, um, we can't keep it in stock. So recycling. So um, this is probably one of the biggest things is, it, it seems compost is fairly easy. Anything you can eat, you can compost. But recycling is, um, good clean paper, cardboard, um, cartons. So, so all the cartons that you have, um, glass. So you wanna make sure it's glass bottles. Um, you see there the pickle jar has the lid kept on. You said it's more advantageous for us to keep the lid on, the lid will be recycled and then it doesn't get all the rest of your recycling um, contaminated. Again, um, tin and aluminum is all recyclable. You want it clean and dry. All these products need to be clean and dry. And then tubs, jugs, and cups can all be recycled. So just a quick slide of, of um, recycling. One ton of paper saves 17 trees, two barrels of oil, 7,000 gallons of water, 4,100 kilowatts of electricity, three cubic yards of land space, so I just want to touch on the land space because really our landfill is one of those places where we have floods, we have fires now, we have all kinds of things that are impacting our landfill. So every time we have the, one of these big, huge um, events in Sonoma County, that impacts the years we have left on our landfill. So I always want to make sure that people know that that's, a, that's an infinite thing. We only have so many years left. So um, your recycling at your house or at your um, business goes into your blue bin. We pick it up. This is our tipping floor right there at our material recovery facility in Santa Rosa. Um, we sort it out and then it gets bailed and then it gets shipped 
either um, to, I wanna say our recycling goes, a lot of our plastics go to Alabama or Southern California. Paper goes to Southeast Asia. Um, the tin aluminum goes down to Vallejo and then the glass goes over to Fairfield. And um, so those are, some of that is domestic and some of it is um, shipped overseas. So people always say, you know, who, who touches my, my recycling? These are sorters. And so your recycling gets touched. So half of it is automated and half of it, half of it is actually touched by, by people that are sorting it out. So um, just be very aware of what you put in. So we've had, um, in the past, we've had a lot of people put needles and things like that. They think they're recyclable and they're not. So I have a slide that, that talks about that, but it's one of those things where, you know, if a needle comes through, we have to shut down the line and that's all taken care of and, and for safety reasons, obviously. So you see this nice gentleman, um, this is what our spindles are during at our material recovery facility. So plastic bags, hoses, any kind of Christmas tree lights, ropes, you don't wanna put in recycling because what happens is it just, it's like a vacuum cleaner where it just spins and spins until it doesn't spin anymore. And so um, every night we have to spend about four hours and we have to clean all of this out. So that's when you put, you're putting your extra bag of garbage underneath that recycling that you have on top. That's all gonna go into here. And um, it just really contaminates all the good recycling that um, your neighbor has put into their recycling cart. So we have this really great website. And so I love to promote this because it's at recology.com at RSM, it's like wet bin. So a lot of people ask me, well, I don't know where a coffee cup goes or I don't know where a napkin goes. So you can go onto our website, you can go on to helpful resources, what then, type in napkin and it'll show you it goes into the compost. So it has a lot of other features. We've just been dealing with some other, um, you know, it'll say about painting, cans of paint, things like that. So this is just a great resource. If you don't wanna stay on the line for a customer service rep, um, this is something you can do on your own. And, and if there's something in there that it's not there, absolutely give us a call and, and we'll put it back, we'll add it to one of our, um, one of our categories. So now what's garbage? After we talk recycling, after we talk composting, what's garbage? So garbage is anything that like a styrofoam, um, plastic bags, uh, chip bags, any single use plastic, uh, straws. Um, if you break a glass or you break a plate, that needs to go into the garbage because those are actually fired at different temperatures. They're made to be reused over and over again. So it's not like a Coke bottle that needs that can be recycled over and over. Uh, a glass is just meant to be used over and over again. That's why they go in the dishwasher or you can put them in your oven for like Pyrex. So um, those break, those break, you need to put them into your um, garbage. Like I said, any single use plastic, plastic bags, any kind of PPE. So if you have masks, you have gloves, any of that kind of stuff, and these all go into the garbage that cannot be recycled. So hazardous waste. So there's a lot of things that people have in their garages underneath their sink. And they ask me, where is it? Where do I take these? And they've been there for years. So we have a lot of different facilities. There's, you can bring them up to um, Gatati to Meacham, which is our central landfill. And then um, in Novato and Marin, they also have hazardous waste. And I've, I've, there's um, websites up there. We also have um, roundups every so often. So um, Zero Waste Sonoma will have dates and you can go on their website and you can find out if there's a, a roundup in your um, in your jurisdiction. So um, this is from a movie called Trash, and this is a, a actor, Jeremy Irons. This is a, a beach in Lebanon. So you can see that this is a global problem that we're dealing with. And any little bit kind of helps to, um, a lot of that could have been, you know, recycled properly on that beach. So I just like to leave on a good note. 
so my good note is you just, just small things that you can do. Um, grocery stores are letting you bag your own groceries now. And so that's a small thing is to bring your own bags in. Use your own knife, fork, and spoon. I carry mine with me. I don't have to use any kind of disposables. I know things are opening back up a little bit more where you can bring your own mug um, into a coffee shop. You just need to call or ask beforehand. But there's a lot of things you can do just on a daily basis that really impacts not taking that plastic bottle, not taking those reusable fork, knife, and spoon, um, and just using, using a lot of reusable things in your own home instead of using any kind of disposal, um, you know, paper plates and things like that. So that is my presentation. Um, I know it was quick, but if anybody, like I said, has questions afterwards, I mean, we'll be here for the duration. Thank you so much, Lisa. Um, I do have one question that I would love for you to answer right sure. now, um, but I would also, Courtney from Zero Waste, thank you so much for answering some of those other questions. Oh, it's Courtney's in there too. Yay! Awesome. <laughs> Um, I think the one question that was left unanswered was um, Heather is wondering if that compost is ever going to be sold to households. You know, um, I've had a lot of questions about that. We, it's more industrial that we're selling it. They do sell it in San Francisco. Um, I'm really, I, I'm hoping that someday we can get it up here. We're hoping to have a compost facility in Sonoma County in the next couple of years out by the sewage I think the sewage treatment plant on Liana Road. So um, hopefully they'll be able to sell compost there. So we're all crossing our fingers that we can buy local compost again, like we used to do up at Meacham. And then Dr. Shrubs just asked if we could get a free green waste container at a community garden. So I do um, pails. So I do in this, for especially uh, you can go to um, our billing department over in Dynamic in Petaluma. And if you want a kitchen pail, they're right out front. So a lot of folks have been getting kitchen pails for their, um, for their food waste. Mm -hmm. And they're okay. free. Well, I will save any other questions uh, for the end for our conversation. But Lisa, again, thank you so much for presenting. We're so grateful mm -hmm. for our partnership with Recology. Um, so now that we've talked a little bit about actions that we as individuals can take to keep our watershed healthy, um, let's take a look at what the city of Petaluma is doing to help community members keep our watershed healthy. So. I am very excited to introduce our next presenter, Danielle. I've had the pleasure of working with her in person several times. <laughs> Danielle is an environmental services technician for the city of Petaluma and has been working for the city for over four years. As part of the environmental services team, she supports all aspects of the department, but her main work focuses on water conservation, storm water, uh, water quality and environmental compliance. And if you apply for the City of Petaluma's Mulch Madness program, you might just see her come and check out your front lawn. Uh, Danielle, are uh, you ready to present? Okay. Thanks so much for being here today. Thank you, Serena. Thank you. Well, it just disappeared. Yeah, no worries. Yeah. I'll leave it to the technical difficulties always. It's okay. We're getting through. We're getting through it together. Thank you, everybody. Make it feel more like you, you know, there was always computer struggles then too. Exactly. All right, we're here. Um, it's not in presentation mode. Oh, forgive me. You're delayed. <laughs> we should be there now. Yep. Yay. All right. Thank you. Thank you, Serena. Thank you, Liz. Thank you, Lisa. Um, I was asked to give a brief overview of our stormwater pollution prevention program. So this is pretty much our program in a nutshell. I'm Danielle Favela. I work for the city of Petaluma. I work at the Ellis Creek Water Recycling Facility where I am right now. Um, and so let's get into it. Um, first off, I just wanted to do a little quick overview of a few main topics that I'll be talking about. The stormwater program in the city of Petaluma is created to protect our local waterways. That's the whole entire point and to protect our storm sewer system. So because of that, we also have a national pollutant discharge elimination system permit from the EPA, which I'll briefly speak on. 
Um, one of our big projects that is currently happening as well is our stormwater trash implementation plan that which came down from the water board. So I'll give you a little bit of background on that, how, how we're going to implement new trash measures to decrease the amount of trash and stormwater pollution that goes into our waterways. Um, another part of our program in general is outreach. Um, if you've been in Petaluma, I guess obviously not during COVID times, but we used to go out all the time and do outreach events uh, with Recology and Daily Acts, but we used to do farmers markets and all the big public events. So that's another part of our program. Um, also, another thing is we have staff that responds to all reported issues. So if somebody calls in, has an issue and sees some illicit discharge or somebody dumping something down a storm drain, there's staff like me and other people that go out and try to enforce and educate the people that are causing um, these issues that are occurring. Um, another thing is we also have construction site inspections. Uh, we have public work inspectors that go out there and also look for stormwater issues and pollution prevention problems. And our main goal is to implement BMP, so best, ma um, best maintenance practices to residentially and commercially to prevent the pollution that is entering into our waterways, which we obviously saw after the dredging event. Um, next slide, please. Okay, so as Serena beautifully talked about this in the beginning, and I love the poll question because a lot of people do not know because it's just not common knowledge. Uh, Petaluma, the city of Petaluma, every city is completely different, but we have a completely separate storm sewer system. So we do not have a combined system, say like San Francisco, where you get a whole bunch of runoff and storm water and flushing throughout the streets. A lot of that will go to their wastewater treatment plant. Here in Petaluma, anything that goes down into our storm drains through that gutter system, that is all going straight to your local waterways, to the river and then to the bay. Um, so I have a really cool picture. Hopefully you have it really big screen right now so you could see it. But all of these little dots are storm water inlets. So what that means is these are like, our, this is our storm drain system and there are over 4,300 storm inlets in the city of Petaluma alone. So if you just let that sink in for a second, that's about 4,400 ways anything can get into our local waterways. Or you can think of it positively and that's 4,400 ways where we could prevent pollution by just changing some of our habits. So um, I like, I'm a numbers person. I find that to be completely fascinating and I love this picture. Um, our stormwater system is created to prevent cooling and flooding on all non-pervious systems or surfaces. So that includes, you know, streets, parking lots, industrial areas, roofs, driveways. And like I said before, if there's anything in the street, on the sidewalk, litter, trash, pesticides, anything that could be flushed from a rain event, this will all flow to a storm sewer system into our local waterways. So obviously, since this is an issue throughout the United States, the EPA created the MPDES permit. And so the, us as a city is required to maintain one of those. And let me go a little bit, actually, hold on. Let's stay right here for a second. Um, so regarding our permit, just in a nutshell, because it's it's, there's a lot to talk about and I don't have a lot of time, but the EPA requires all states, cities, villages, or any type of public entity that discharges water into the, into the water into the United States, they all require a certain permits. So depending on who you are and how many people are in your city, there's various different types of permits. So um, let's go to the next slide, please. All right. So we have our permit, which is called a phase two small municipal permit. Um, recently, just to talk about one particular program or project that's happening or has been happening is the water board created a trash control program to address all the, to address all the potential trash that's going into our waterways. So the idea is we wanna prevent 
all of this pollution from going into our local waterways. So what do we do and what as a city can we do? So to respond to this new program, the city created an implementation plan. So what that means is we created a plan on what we are going to do to prevent as much as we can the trash is going into our local waterways. So what we first started out is we created a model. Um, we had some help with that and we created a baseline map of how much trash is in Petaluma. And by doing that, we created a categorical system. We did lots of field surveys. I'll show you a, ma a map in a second, but we needed to find a way to hone in where to start and what to do. Because instead of just saying, we're gonna do the whole entire city, let's focus and start in the highest trashed areas. So that's our plan. And um, these high trash areas usually include like bus stops, parking lots, really high traffic areas like downtown, um, certain streets, industrial areas and things of that sort. So it gives us a place to start. And then the water board gave us a deadline of full final compliance by 2030. Next slide. So this is our baseline, baseline trash map. So if we look at it, it's color, um, color coded. Uh, the purple would mean the most very, very highest amount of trash generated in that particular area. Thankfully, we do not have these extreme dense high trashed areas. There's an actual completely um, numerical system and how you calculate that. So the city of Petaluma currently does not have that, but we do have, as, as you can see in the pink, a lot of the very high trash generated areas. So a model was created and we had, uh, we used aerial imagery um, on land survey assessment. So boots on the ground, trying to determine which areas had the highest trash generation and where we could start to focus our trash implementation plan. So as you can see, we have a lot of pink in the downtown area, um, the whole North McDowell area, um, industrial area, the moderate is the yellow and the green is very low and that's mostly we get into, um, it obviously depends, but we get into some more uh, multifamily areas or community kind of parks and things of that sort. Um, also, if you see, we've mapped out the bus stops because bus stops also seem to be a big generator of trash. So, and yeah, the red ones are really high areas. So these, this is pretty much our priority list for now that we're going to start with. And we have the 10 year 2030 guideline to implement new, um, new measures or increase some of the things we're already doing to help reduce the trash. Next model, please, or next slide. Okay, so in a nutshell, these are some of our current and future trash control, control me measures that we're currently either already doing or planning on ramp ramping up or doing more of. So um, that includes full capture systems, which we're currently looking into, that would be something that you would put into a storm drain that would capture all of the trash. So if there was a large storm event, all that first flush would be captured by either some type of um, receptacle system. They sound amazing, they're great, they take a lot of maintenance. So it's a lot about where do we put them, who's going to do it, how often do you maintain them? It would be a new thing for the city, but that's something we're looking into. Um, obviously more frequent street sweeping, which we have um, implemented, looking into more parking enforcement, especially downtown, to get people to move their cars so we can thoroughly sweep and pick up that trash. Um, always ramping up public outreach, um, more cleanup and volunteer cleanup programs. Um, also working with the police department uh, regarding illegal um, dumping and also people not covering their loads on their trucks and trailers and things of that sort. It's amazing how much trash you can get from people not covering um, just their vehicle loads. It's amazing. Um, let's see. Let me get here. Um, next thing is also we're looking into adding more trash bins around river areas and things of that sort. So it's all about where to put them, 
how often to maintain them. So all these really simple, simple ideas, but um, it's all slowly coming together. Um, and then another big one is we clean our storm sewer systems every year. We have a, a complete staff who does that, but probably ramping up what we're going to be doing, um, especially before stormwater season. So ramping up more cleaning, maybe creating a new schedule and things of that sort. So that is, like I said, in a nutshell, some of the, the future and current measures we are trying to implement and are doing to reduce that trash into our local waterways. Next slide, thank you. So another thing that we do that is fun. So a fun, obviously trash reduction, besides what the city can do, can, can do, it also is really dependent on what the residents can do. So we, um, trash cleanups are a great thing. The city has participated in those prior. Um, I have some cool numbers that we have from a couple years ago. I love this because it shows a trend um, because in what was it 2016 about 40% of California was covered by the plastic ban. So if you look from our first event in spring where we started um, actually recording these numbers, it wasn't our first event that we obviously um, helped friends of Petaluma River, of course, it wasn't our event. But um, when we started keeping numbers, if you see that first one to the fourth one, you can see a 73% reduction in um, the plastic bags that we or found throughout the different sites. So that was just a positive thing to see, seeing that maybe this band is actually working and we're getting less trash or people are becoming more aware to be using reusable single use items. Um, we also, like John Shrib said, helped uh, facilitate with the dredge cleanup efforts. They did all the work. Um, lots of nonprofits all got together. City is just there to help when, however is needed. I did see as well that the Friends of the Petaluma River, because I know you'll have Stephanie on next week, but I saw that there's another river cleaning cleanup coming up pretty soon. So that would be another great way to participate. And, and in a nutshell, like I said, the city of Petaluma participates in these cleanups, big and small, as a part of our public outreach. Next slide, please. All right, so before COVID, you would find us all the time at farmer's markets, butter and eggs, art and garden festival, in numerous different ways, trying to get the word out, even just to have a conversation with somebody, give them some outreach, each outreach material, tell people about getting rid of single use plastic and giving people reusable items. That was something that we were doing almost weekly. Um, it's uh, unfortunately with COVID, we haven't done anything for a good year um, out in the public, but it's a really great way for us to communicate to all the residents in the community of Petaluma what we're trying to do and ways to help and have those open conversations. Um, another great way as well is uh, working with school children. So from elementary school to high school, we also teamed up with the uh, Friends of Petaluma River to do a really awesome, what is it called? Uh, like a video contest. So we, we use environmental topics every single year. Children can win, children and obviously young adults can win scholarships. And it's just another great way to not just focus our efforts on the adults in the home, but also the children and how they can implement ways starting as young as they can um, to their adulthood on how to prevent all of this trash within our waterways. Um, another part of our program, uh, so stormwater in general, switching gears. Another part of our program is our illicit discharge response and enforcement. So multiple departments throughout the city all work together to respond to these type of stormwater issues. So it just depends on what it is. The fire department will respond to hazardous materials. Our police and code enforcement will, will notify us, the environmental services team, if they see anything. So it's all interwoven, we all work together. But what usually happens is people call and complain or they see something and we want to encourage people to go out there and, and tell us what they see so we can go out and prevent and pr prevent these issues and protect the storm sewer system. So this is a really good example. This was one I went to 
I don't know, about a year or so ago, um, somebody was trying to work on their radiator and boom, that's what happened. It cracked right on the street. Thankfully, it didn't go into the storm sewer system, but these kind of things happen all the time and everything can be completely avoided just by spending a little extra time and you know, not working on this. There's so many things you can do, not doing vehicle maintenance on the street. Um, Cause I don't know how many times I've responded to people spilling oil. That's a big one that happens a lot. Um, let's, let's see. Um, another thing that we also do besides going out there to educate the people that are, that are having the problem, try, teach them how to prevent it, obviously take care of it, get rid of it. So then it's not affecting the community and, um, pretty much just teaching people what to do and how to do it. Um, our biggest problems that we have, like I said before, are vehicle maintenance, people draining pools and hot tubs straight into the street into the storm drains. Um, lots of home renovation projects we come across. So people cutting tile or painting and uh, dumping their paint water into the, into the storm drain. Or um, just when you cut tile, there's a lot of water use, lots of like very fine silt just flowing down the driveway into the storm drain. So these are the kind of things we see all the time. And especially with commercial businesses, we see a lot of uh, washing equipment outside. So that's, these are the things that we are constantly seeing, but these are the things that every time we respond to one, we give them all the information we possibly can. We help prevent it. And we very rarely ever have to go back to the same place. So one by one, trying to get that word out there, that's, that's our goal. Um, and then obviously I wanna share with all of you to call and report any illicit discharge and you will have the number um, on my last slide. All right, so one thing I wanted to share. So I know we were talking mostly about indoor stuff today and next week, Daily Axe is doing, in the city of Petaluma will be there and different one of our staff will talk about outdoor stuff. But indoor wise, Lisa touched on it perfectly. Um, disposing of our trash properly is probably the biggest thing you possibly could do to prevent what we were seeing in the dredge materials. So it's something that simple, but it's hard because everybody needs to do it and you have to do it properly. Another big thing is to try to reduce or eliminate the use of single use plastics. So that includes plastic beverage containers, takeout containers, plastic bags and all stuff like that. The city also provides reusable items as well. So it'll be great to get back into outreach eventually to bring those back out to the community and um, people love them. And I feel like it's extremely helpful because we have to remember that residents are playing the most important role in the, in the health of our creeks and our waterways. And so just these small little changes could really help reduce trash generation in the home. Um, let's see what else we got here. Um, another thing is has hazardous waste. So just Proper disposal and recycling is really important. So people aren't pouring these things down the drain, into their landscape, outside, into a storm drain. It's amazing how many people just, they just don't fully know that if, if you have a whole bu bucket of oil or a whole bunch of paint wash, that putting it into the storm drain is just gonna go straight to your creek. So um, trying to teach people about that and people knowing that there are a lot of recycling facilities and a lot of programs that you can use to dispose of all of that proper, properly. And like Lisa talked about, Zero Waste Sonoma is a great place to start. And then I wanted to briefly touch on Our Water, Our World. So they, we contract with them. They're really helpful as in they provide outreach and support to help people find less toxic products to use inside their home and their garden. They also go out to like Freedmen's and other different places and do tabling events to help people before they buy Roundup or whatever it's going to be to show them the alternative products to use, how to dispose of them and um, how to use them. So their website's fantastic if you're looking for some alternatives. It's very thorough and specific. So I definitely suggest, thank you for putting that up there to go ahead and visit that. And Let's see if there's anything else I'm missing. Oh, and then uh, PetSafe, 
stormwater pet safe products is really a big one. That's a whole nother webinar. So but to look into that is a great place to start as well. And then uh, next slide, please. And then, yeah, so here's my contact information. Um, I will be here till the end to answer any questions, but if there's anything very specific or you want to email me or call me and something we can really get into, feel free to jot that down. Um, I also want to give you the information that if you do see any, you know, water, you know, we're having a really dry year. If you're seeing any water waste or any crazy runoff or irrigation issues or somebody dumping things or illicit discharge anywhere, please call. Um, somebody like me or one of our staff will go out and we will take care of the situation and educate whomever we need to, to prevent these problems from occurring constantly. And um, just some of, just some other websites. And I think, I think that's about it. Thank you so much, Danielle. That was really informative. Uh, we were talking, uh, Danielle and Lisa and I and Liz were talking yesterday about how grateful we are that we could all like, come together to address this issue because it is really going to take, you know, like all of us coming together, not just community members, but, you know, we need the government entities and programs to come together too to address these things. So thank you so much for being here today. Uh, Liz, if you could just uh, queue up my last couple of slides. I just have a couple of upcoming events I wanted to make you all aware of, and then we can wrap up with any questions that anyone might have lingering still. One second. Always I love look. your background image, John. You're on mute still. <laughs> Liz, if you can't get it, I can always do it too. I think I have it. Yeah, I got a serious lag on my end. Okay, here, I'll, I'll try. Okay, thanks. Let's see here. Oh, I think you just got it. All right, good. I'll get us to the larger presentation too. Hopefully. Learning a lot while doing this behind the scenes, that's for sure. Okay, I'm almost there. And boom. Perfect. Okay. Um, so I just wanted to go over a couple of upcoming events we have that I thought you all might be interested, events and opportunities. So go ahead and hit next slide, Liz. So the most relevant one uh, is the second part of this webinar series coming up next Tuesday, same time. Um, instead of talking about household actions, we're going to be talking, oh, it's still household actions. We're just going to really dive into landscape actions. So like, what can you do on your landscape to help retain that rainwater on your landscape so it's not just running off into the stormwater drains? Also, um, Stephanie from Friends of the Petaluma will be, Pet Friends of the Petaluma River will be presenting um, a little bit more too about the recent dredging and just some of like the ecological perspective of that dredging versus today, I think we covered more of the human aspect and the volunteers and the, and the, the physical, like what actually happened. So I highly recommend you attend that if you're interested in learning a little bit more about the landscape opportunities. Another thing I wanted to make you all aware of is our Leadership Institute is currently open for applications for the class of 2022. So it's a 10-month long leadership training program that provides inspiration, skills, and support for people passionate about transformative change. Uh, people can apply from like really any sector, like government sector, schools, businesses, uh, any sort of community outreach. It's uh, really a program that's made to bring everybody together to address the problems that we're facing today. So you can learn more at dailyx.org slash leadership institute. And I'll also be sending all these resources in a follow-up email, everything we've mentioned today. And then the last thing I wanted to bring up is the mayor's challenge. Um, so Petal city of Petaluma, uh, is, uh, we can uplift them and all their progressive efforts towards water conservation by signing up for the mayor's challenge, My Water Pledge, which is actually a competition between cities across the United States. Uh, to see who could be the most water wise and I know Petaluma has actually come in in like the top 10 in past years so it'd be cool if we could do that again especially since this year is a dry year and there's some amazing prizes available too I think there's like a truck that could be donated to like your favorite nonprofit or something like that Danielle you can correct me if I'm wrong but really cool prizes make sure to check it out at mywaterpledge.com and then as always we couldn't do the work that we do without our amazing sponsors so we always like to give them a big thank you 
And then feel free to contact me as well if you have any questions, uh, serena at dailyact.org. I'll be sending the follow-up email so you can go ahead and just hit reply. And I can also put you in contact with Danielle or Lisa if that's what you prefer. Um, and we are fueled by good vibes, but donations never hurt. So if you'd like to support our programs, you can donate on our website at dailyact.org. And then with that being said, Liz, I'll have you stop your screen share. Um, and if anybody has any questions for Lisa or Danielle or myself, or just wants to say anything like open conversation at this point, thank you so much for being here today. But make sure you all unmute yourselves. <laughs> Okay. I've got uh, two, two maybe comments and then a question. Of course. Uh, uh, when you talked earlier about the um, water coming off roofs and roads, and I've seen some research in the past where we have a huge amount of pollution that comes off our roofs. Uh, everything, especially mostly the asphalt and all the particles that are in the roofs and all the chemicals that go making it in the shingles, both the regular wood shingles, there's the uh, chemicals that are used to penetrate and so make them more uh, a water repellent. So all these chemicals in our roofs uh, spill out and then go into our gutters, which then go down and then eventually end up in our creeks. So uh, putting in a, a rain catchment system, uh, a, a little pond area is really good, but you do need to clean it out once in a while and make sure you put the particles which are chemically contaminated with your roof chemicals and get that rid of that uh, as a possibility. I have a rain catchment system myself and uh, 500 gallons. And the main reason is not just for collecting water, but for earthquake safety. And there's an earthquake, we're gonna lose all our pipes. Pipes break. And so I have 500 gallons of water always will be available for me and my neighbors um, in case of that happening. And you need a week of water to survive uh, after a major earthquake. The, um, and then roads, uh, same thing with the roads, as far as the hard surfaces, it's not just what, we, what gets dropped onto the road, it's the road itself, the amount of tires Everybody replaces their tires, which means they wear out. And all that wearings goes on the roads, which then goes into the gutters, which goes into our creeks. So a huge amount of rubber from our tires, as well as our oil and other bits and pieces off our cars end up going into our creeks. So when you can get out of your car and onto your bicycle, walk, or public transport, that also saves a lot of pollution going into our creeks. So, so stop driving your car and start riding your bike, please. There's another good reason for reducing pollution on the roadways and saving our creeks. So those are my comments. But my question goes back to what I said earlier, just as back to Lisa, um, because I help manage a community garden locally. And we have lots of weeds that we pull out of our garden beds and the like. And we even do have, we have some composting, but we don't want to put our weeds and our weed seed in our regular compost. We'd rather send them to your compost. Mm -hmm. uh, how can we set up a system uh, for community gardens so that we have a, a large green waste can out that we can hopefully get picked up for free since we're a nonprofit growing food for the homeless. Um, you know, that would be a, a kind of a separate conversation offline with me. Um, and then I know um, we have some compost set up for um, Penlima Bounty. So um, you can just, you know, um, email me like uh, separately, like I said, at like lmoreofrecology.com and we can talk about trying to set something up separately. Excellent, thank you. You're welcome. John, what you said about tires is so true. I read an article about that recently and was a little bit horrified thinking of all the cars going across the road and all the microplastics being left behind and being washed in the watershed. So thank you so much for bringing that up. Both really, really relevant topics. Courtney, I saw you had your hand up. Yes, thank you. Hi, everyone. Um, my name is Courtney Scott. I work for Zero Waste Sonoma and I manage the county's household hazardous waste program. So I wanted to let you guys know about some um, hazardous waste collection events that we have coming up. Um, we have them every Tuesday at a different location throughout the county. Uh, unfortunately, the next two weeks are canceled due to COVID. Um, but then we do have one coming up on April 27th in Cloverdale. It sounds like you guys are focusing on Petaluma today. So the next Petaluma event is June 29th, but you guys are close to the permanent hazardous waste facility, uh, which Lisa mentioned is at the central disposal site. Um, so you can always go there. Uh, residents can go there Thursdays through Saturdays and it's free for residents to dispose of things. So a lot of the stuff you talked about today would 
uh, belong at a facility like that, things like car fluids, motor oils, um, pool chemicals, pesticides, fertilizers, things like that, um, that could run uh, into the creeks would be important to dispose of at the hazardous waste facility. Um, some of you may also be affected by a recent disposal issue with treated wood waste. If you have any pressure treated wood, it's you haven't been able to dispose of it for four months now. We are having a special disposal, disposal event for Santa Rosa residents on Sunday, April 25th. You can find information for that on our website at zerowastesonoma.gov. Um, and then we also have an e-waste collection program coming up or event this weekend in Sonoma. It's um, April 9th through 11th at the Sonoma Community Center, and that is free for Sonoma County residents. And that's it, thank you. I just thank wanted to add one thing too, I'm sorry, about batteries. I know batteries is a huge thing and people ask me, that's a, a question I get asked a lot. Um, batteries are included and, and fluorescent light bulbs for, for hazardous waste also. Courtney, thank you so much for coming today and for sharing all of your knowledge with us. We're super appreciative. Did anybody else have any comments or questions before we wrap up today? Douglas, go ahead. Hey there, great presentation. Yeah, I, I'm just curious, um, Lisa, on the compostable food weight or food waste. And, you know, I, I love to support restaurants right now and you can't dine in a lot of places. So, but we're seeing a ton of compostable uh, materials coming from restaurants. And I always think, oh, this is great because it's going to get composted. But from what I understand that, especially the cups aren't, I understand the, um, like the, the food packaging, if, if it's um, soiled, it can be put in the compost bin, but not the plastics or the, the forks and things like that. What do we have as a solution to tell restaurant tours what would be more appropriate? Would it be better to have plastic to go cups that could be recycled versus compostable? Any ideas? I um, I'm actually going to be partnering with the city and doing um, a separate um, presentation in May just to kind of talk about for restaurants. Um, yes, I, I I encourage just regular plastic cups that can be just um, taken home and put into your recycle. I also encourage um, different kinds of material that almost as it feels like an egg carton that that can be composted in your regular compost at home. So I encourage a lot of the restaurants, if they're gonna be buying in bulk and they're gonna be doing a lot of to-go is either have it recyclable or have it be some kind of material that is um, compostable. So we, I go in and, and do a lot of education for restaurants that have questions about that. Um, again, if you're taking it home, don't take the knife, fork and spoon. When I call and get to go, I say, can you please not put any of that into my, um, you know, my to go? Cause I don't need that. I don't need any ketchup packets. I don't need salt and pepper. I just don't need any of that stuff. I'm bringing it straight to my house. So um, I think those are just always great things, especially if you eat out a lot is to um, be conscious of that you can make those choices. You can tell that restaurant that you don't need any of those products. And as things start to open up, I'm hoping, hoping, hoping in the near future that we can, we used to be able to bring in our own containers, you know, and just put our to go in there. And we used to be able to do that at starting to be able to do that at grocery stores. So fingers crossed, things will start to get back to normal and we can get back to more of a zero waste society that we all love and aspire to. Yeah, thanks for the tip on the uh, produce stickers. Um, I, I I didn't realize they they're gonna mess up the, the composting, so I'll do a better job of um, sharing that knowledge and taking. I'm, I usually do take them off, but um, I'm sure some slip in there. And now that I'll be much more aware of making sure they're always coming off before the compost goes out. Thank you. Yeah, Douglas, that was a great question. Thanks for asking. And Lisa, those were awesome tips. It's like the thing you always forget to do, but you know, hopefully we're all feeling a little more inspired to do those things too. Now there's a company here in Petaluma that I've met 
Uh, they've been in favor of producing a compostable uh, table utensils. Um, and is there any, if, is it truly in compostable stuff that they are producing? And if it is, can we somehow promote them since they're a local company doing this? Can we get their materials out to more restaurants here locally somehow? Can we, can we give them some support to do that? It would be, how, how I look at it is, I have to look at the materials that are there, they say that they're compostable. Um, you know, we take wooden utensils or wooden like skewers and, and wooden knives and forks and, and spoon. That's all can go into the compost. But if it's compostable plastic, we do not take that. And it's not so much recology doesn't take it, is we don't have facilities that will take any of that compostable material. So um, that's just kind of my, it is what it is. Okay, so if it's a, like a starch-based product, I know I've heard a lot about starch-based bottles and starch, I use like biodegradable doggy bags is what I put out over at the park. Um, and they're supposed to be starch-based bags. Are they really not compostable or, or biodegradable? Well, and for dog, for dog waste, that should go in the garbage anyways, because yeah. that should never go into your compost. Any kind of um, dog or cat waste does not go into your compost. So, um, you know, the only time you can use a compostable bag in, in Petaluma is if you have a commercial um, account and you have a bin, which is, you know, a dumpster. We have Richmond that allows compostable bags for commercial properties that way. But for residents, um, you cannot use compostable bags and that goes to a separate compost facility down Novato, which is run by waste management. It's an organic compost facility and they don't take any kind of compostable plastics. Even starch based, any compostable plastics is compostable plastics. It's across the board. So those compostable green garbage nuts, nuts, the compostable liner I'm putting in my little compost thing. I sh I've been using those shit. <laughs> <laughs> and the, what's, a, what's a better thing to do is for me, I don't even line mine. I, I know it's sensitive, but I just throw it straight into my, um, to my green cart. But if I was gonna line it, a lot of people use just paper bag. And so this is a much better way of doing it. Um, a little bit of a paper bag inside also keeps the keeps it from being so yucky. But um, but yes, you shouldn't be using any kind of compostable bag. So I was just looking on your website, Lisa, and I, I think I kind of missed a little bit. Is there a place on your website? I thought I heard you say this, but maybe this wasn't true. That you could like say like right now I have a little bit of chicken. It's wrapped in. Um, from the butcher shop like this butcher paper mm -hmm. can i compost that yes absolutely it seems to have a little plastic liner in it like you know we've gone back and forth on that so we just did a kind of an experiment on glassine uh -huh. um like that those liners yeah and so butcher paper if it has the wax on it it's fine if it's got a little bit of plastic you just kind of have to be your best kind of like detective on this of what is in on that butcher paper. So for me, the butcher paper that I get from like Oliver's, the king I can go in. It can be composted. Yeah. So it would be it, I, I didn't find this on your website, but maybe it's there. It'd be really cool. Like if you if I was like, oh, I wonder if I can compost this and you can go and like go and say, hey, so, yeah, is there a place I can compost like my milk carton, my carton of milk. Can I compost that? My husband says I can, but I don't think I can. You can, you can recycle that. So we do have something on our website that says what bin. Okay. So it's under our resources. And so you just need to go in there. It says what bin. And then you can type in milk cartons. It will show you exactly which bin to put it into. So it's under, um, yeah. So you just go under our resources under recology. But it's, but it's one of those things too, that I always tell people, if you really don't know, if it's some kind of material that you are just like, I got this from Amazon, I have no idea. Call us, email us, you know, that's what Waste Zero um, in Recology, that's what we do, which we live for, is to get those materials and we say yay or nay, we do experiments on them, we put them in water, we burn them, we do all kinds of stuff to see if they're 
um, compostable or recyclable. So you can also check out uh, zerowastesonoma.gov. We have a similar tool um, where you can search for lots of items and where to bring them for disposal, recycling, reuse, all that stuff. Um, and then we also have what we call the eco desk and you can call us, that phone number is just on our homepage as well, zerowastesonoma.gov. Same thing, you can call us and um, ask us what to do with an item and we will call you back and let you know what's best, where it, where it will best be handled. <laughs> well, I've heard some people say, oh, when in doubt, just throw it in the recycle bin and they're gonna sort it. So they'll sort it. <laughs> well, well, it does get no. sorted out, but what happens is, is it makes more, it's, it's more time consuming and maybe it contaminates other good recycling. So a little bit of legwork on the up end of uh, somebody who says, I wonder if this is recyclable or not or compostable. You know, we're all on our phones, we're all on the computer a lot. So I always say a little light reading on the Recology website, um, you know, and just make yourself a little more educated of, of what goes where. It's, it changes a lot of times every year of, of what we take and what we don't take. So um, those are just always great things to, to have some knowledge about. Thank you. You're welcome. Okay, everyone. Well, I'm going to wrap it up for today. Um, I want to respect everybody's time. Such a treat to have so many extra experts on, on our panel today. Thank you so much for showing up and for sharing all of your knowledge and for being passionate about keeping our watershed clean. Uh, you'll all be receiving a follow-up email. So if anyone has any additional questions, Lisa's email will be included in there. My email will be included in there. I'll include Danielle in there as well. So contact information will be included to continue these conversations. But thank you so much for joining us today. So grateful. And everyone have a great evening. You too. Have a good time. Right, thank you. Thanks, thank everyone. You. Bye. Justice. Oh, I guess we should stop recording and get off Facebook Live.